good evening. Okay, so I sound okay now. Let's bring up the music a little bit. Sounds like we're okay, so let me shut that one sound off and continue on. Okay, if anybody has any comments, go ahead and talk about it in the chat. And um, the music coming from Pretzel Rock. Pretzel Rock, I can't even say it. And the... Uh, composer is Harris Heller. And you can see that in the stream. Okay, well we're on a new aircraft. Let's go out and get a nice picture of this little hummer. And there she is. Isn't that a beauty? That is an Airbus A3ST, the Beluga, and a little background on it is A300. This simulator model just came out yesterday. In the builds, I N I B U I L D S. In the simulation is who makes it. They also make a freighter in A300 day. 600, but this is their new entry, and it's got a lot of really cool stuff. Now, this is a custom airport, and the airport, let me get the name of who that is, don't want to say that incorrectly. So the airport is Haywarden, it's in Wales. The identifier is Echo Gulf November Romeo, and it's a zero dollar payware. So it's free when you buy the Beluga. The Beluga is $44.99 Gulf Bravo Papa. I guess that's the euro. Actually, the euro is 5226, and the U.S. is 6232 plus tax. And it's got just tons of great features on it, and we're going to go through some of those. I did a video earlier, and uh, as always, you know, it didn't work. No sound. Also, on here we have the information across the top. The information across the top is done by Fly Live Studios. Okay. Now the first thing we want to do before we uh, get too far into the airplane is we want to load our cargo. <laughs> this is the really cool part. So let me get rid of my FMS here. I was working on uh, that. Also the custom uh, 
pictures or camera positions are by X camera. That's an add-on for X plane. So let's go inside to the tablet. A lot of great information on here right now. The checklist is on there. But let's go out and start this. So there's several things. There's the takeoff performance. We're going to look at that. We just saw the checklist. Ground operations we're going to do. There's the ADAs, panel states, and settings. Settings is where you set your pounds and how fast you want the IRS to align and uh, the links for the um, STD flight directors and uh, barometers so that you don't have to go set them all. You just set one and all of them reset. Let's see down here my nose wheel steering is the yaw on my uh, on my yoke on my uh, Logitech Extreme 3D Pro. And you got volumes over here, and you've got where you can put in your username for SimBrief, and it will automatically download your information into the airplane, which is really cool. I guess I couldn't hit return. Let's go to Ground Ops. Now, we just did Ground Services. That's where I got my external power and chalk. Let's look at the loader. And you can uh, have several things. You can have an Airbus fuselage. You can have Airbus wings. That's what this factory really makes here. You can haul a helicopter. I really like that. Uh, you can haul a space station part. You know, when you see the people on the International Space Station looking out all those windows that are in a circle. Anyway, that is this space station part. And you can haul random cargo. I'm not sure what that is. And you can haul an Airbus 380 tail. So we're going to haul a helicopter. So you pick the helicopter and you request the loader. And you go look outside, and there's the door opening, and there's the helicopter. <laughs> oh, this is just too cool. And again, remember, we're at the Custom Airport, so there's all the A320 wings out there. So you can load your Beluga right here. Or you can taxi in here, have the tug tow you into the hangar. The doors will open and shut around the nose, and you can load it from inside. Here's a little shot looking around the airport. There's the approach into runway 22. GA's over there. More Airbus stuff here. Uh, some old hangars. The control tower. Actually, that's a radar. Maybe the control tower is right underneath it, or it's in that building. Anyway, so this is a custom airport. Really nice. Another shot of the door. So, let's see where my... loader is raising the helicopter. And if you notice, get right up in here and watch. And it takes about 30 to 35 minutes to load the cargo. Which is great because it's going to take you at least that long to uh, get your act together and get the airplane started. Now, this uh, Airbus plan is over in Wales. There are several C 
cities where Airbus parts are made. Like you said, these are A320 wings that are made here. Well, let's see. And then you can take these parts and fly them all over the world. And they have um, the routes, call signs, all the information you need about where you want to go. So I decided that I wanted to take this helicopter and go to Kansas City. You all know I live in Kansas City. Oh, I live at the Lake of the Ozarks, but I'm from Kansas City. And uh, so that's why I you know, like to go to that airport. get right in here. Now there's a little U-shaped thing here on the front of the loader and it's going to go right up into the docking part. You can also control some stuff lights in here from that panel over there. There's a hatch right there where you climb up from the cockpit up into the bay. So I was going to do a flight from uh, this airport to Kansas City. Well, that's a little too far. So then I decided I was going to go to Stuart Newburgh, which is an old Air Force base in New York, and I used to fly in there when I flew for the airline. I thought that'd be a good place to go and then go to Kansas City. Well, uh, as it turned out, that was right at the maximum distance that the airplane could fly. Okay. So it looks like we are up against the side of the airplane. So let's go back inside here and tell the loader that we want to load that helicopter. And then we'll go back outside and see if that transpires. Now the first thing that's got to happen is the pads have to come down. And then once they come down and that whole unit is stabilized, up there they come down, then the helicopter will start moving and go back into the airplane. Now they actually did this. They hauled one of these down to Australia, I believe. They must have had to make it a lot of stop. Because this thing, because of all the drag, does not have it. Ultra range. It flies. It flies. Oh, there he is. Let's go up and look. Watch that thing go in there. Just great animations. This outfit did a really cool job with all this. Yeah, it looks like my strobes are on. So anyway, it'll go in there and stop and they'll tie it down. And we can kind of look at it from inside also. Oh, I'm looking. Okay. Let's look from the back to the front of the cargo. So, the Beluga doesn't carry really heavy things. It carries really bulky things like fuselages and wings and helicopters. Now, there's several different liveries for the airplane. You can fly this FedEx and haul cargo down in Memphis, or you can fly UPS, or DHL has a really cool yellow and orange airplane in this style. Let's go back and look at the... Um, that's from the cockpit. Shut off that caution light. Let's go back to the ab tab. And let's remove... Uh, it looks like we're still loading. So, like I said, the whole process takes about 35 minutes to uh, get it all done. Frame rate's not too bad, 23. 
you need at least 25 to do uh, that zoom. This is the first time I'm going to fly across the pond in the simulator. I had a really cool experience when I was an uh, ex-airline pilot. When my airline went out of business and we quit flying the Airbus, I was on the internet looking for a job and uh, I came across a job where they were ferrying one of our Airbuses that they'd taken down and repainted. And we were going to go from Lake Charles, Louisiana to Ismar, Turkey. Ooh, that's a long way. And the captain, the reason I got the job was they needed a U.S. airline transport pilot rated pilot. And uh, they didn't have one. So the captain was, I believe he was from Aer Lingus over in Ireland. And me being Irish, that was really cool. Anyway, they hired me to be the co-pilot. So I flew down to Lake Charles, Louisiana, and we picked up the plane and flew it all the way to Ismar, Turkey. It was two legs. We flew up to Iceland, and then from there we flew all the way down to Turkey. And for those of you that uh, love FMS and programming it, we did not have a database. We had to load everything. We had to load our routes. We had to load the approach at the airport we were going to land at. None of that was in the FMS. Okay, let's go back up here and remove the loader. Let me see if this will work. Get my right finger on that. Now we'll go back outside and watch and see what happens. What should be happening is those speed ought to be going up. I don't have my camera on your night. I didn't figure you would be too disappointed if you didn't see me sitting in the cockpit. <laughs> we have a new follower, Lori, 44444. She came today. I didn't get to talk to her, but she's my latest follower. That's nice. So, let me see. I think it looks like that little hummer is going up. Again, it takes about 35 minutes for this whole um, evolution to... Uh, it doesn't look like to me it's working. <laughs> Let's go back in. Check my app tab. Okay. Um, I, guess what, I guess that load was not... It wasn't loaded yet. So there's remove the loader back outside. And let's see what's going on with our feet. Okay, the feet are going up. <laughs> so you can't hurry. Here my marshal are over there. He's still standing around with his arms up in here. Can't really see him back. Okay, so our feet are up and the loader up there goes, backing away. And while that's going on, the door's coming down. Pretty cool. So again, this was an Airbus 300. It came out in the 80s. So the flight deck and navigational information is from the 70s. So this was one of the very first Airbuses that had uh, screens, like ECAM screens. With, uh, and you'll see when we get inside, we'll look at the uh, instrument panel and 
back then they were a little bit cautious about going to glass. So almost everything is backed up by steam gauges. <laughs> There he is, he's still got his arms up. Okay. So now the loader is coming down and the door is coming down. So we really don't need to. Oh, let's look at that from up in the air. That's kind of cool. And I think we can zoom in and kind of look at it. Nice looking airplane. I believe there's five of these. And like I say, you can also get them in Delta paint job, uh, Lufthansa. You can haul cargo all over the world. So. Like I said, this airplane just came out yesterday. Welcome if you're on. Go ahead and chat if you'd like to. And there goes my loader back. My door's almost shut. Let's go back inside. I have done some preliminary stuff. I did a sim brief. I uh, loaded my root in my FMS and then I had to change it. Like I said, this is the first time I've flown the simulator across the Atlantic, so you're going to have to bear with me. I tried taking off the other night. I think last night I finally got it started after watching about five hours worth of training videos on the A300-600, which talks about basically it's the same airplane, but it talks about all the systems and how everything works. And when I took off, I crashed. So, <laughs> That's my story. <laughs> Oop, my loader's gone, and there's my my guy there. So the next thing we want to do is start the APU. Actually, before we do that, let's talk about what's on this overhead panel. There's an awful lot of systems up here. The inertial reference system. There's three of them. So there's one there one there, one there, and the controller is right here. So the first thing you do when you get in the airplane after you get the battery on and the external power is you want to align these IRS's internal reference system. That's how you navigate. And it's got two HF radios which are inoperative. It's got a few circuit breakers. Coming down, here's the flight recorders. And then you got spoilers and speed brakes, pitch feel and rudder travel, slats and flaps, servo controllers, and they're right above hydraulics. And in the Airbus, it has three systems, and they're blue, green, and yellow. And this is one of the first places where the um, analog versus ECAM is coming up. So let's go down here and grab an ECAM screen. And then let's go back up. So, now you know on an Airbus, it has, uh, like a 320, it has a little controller for the ECAM right below the screen. But on this A300, it's clear down here at the bottom. So anyway, there is the hydraulic page. And then let's go back up and look at the hydraulic page. So it's basically showing that the, what does it say, the pressure I'm guessing that is. Then you got the storm lights, and the 
dome light. And you can make it bright if you want to. The cell call, calling the mechanic. Let's go over to this one. Here's all the lights. We've got our Turn that strobe off. The landing lights are extended but off. Those are the logo lights. You really don't want the runway lights on. Just to be. Here's our engine anti-ice. And then what we have is the pitch trim. You need to turn those on, the yaw dampeners, and this ATS switch. And once you do all that, then the flight control panel will be lit up. And there it is right there. Similar to the Airbus 320, but not exactly. This is going to be a multi I'm sorry, a multi-part stream. Okay, so now, those are the pitch trim. Now we're into electrical. Electrical power. The batteries are here. There's three of them. They are on but not lit up. The only time these lights come on is when the battery is charging. And then this is, there it goes one, battery one is charging. Now this green line basically shows where the electrical system is going. There's generator one, the APU generator, there's our external power, and there's generator two, and everything above it. And uh, the galley. And then uh, the left engine uh, fire handle. And then again, remember this thing about ECAM? Let's go down below. There's an AC page. So, now, again, remember, it, they didn't really like this TV uh, computerized stuff. They like that old steam gauge stuff. So, the electrical system has a backup. And you can see everything about the electrical system right there. And then you got the cockpit door controller. It's the cockpit voice recorder. It has two landing gear indicators. It has one down below, just above the gear handle, and one up above as a backup up here. There's the stick pushers for a stall, the APU fire handle, the reading light, and the fuel panel. So the pumps are in there, they're on right now. Below are the quantities. The engine start is similar to an Airbus 320, except that you have to introduce fuel on this airplane. So on the lower panel are the fuel cutoffs. So you'll see when we get to the start where we put the start from up here, but we have to go down there and turn on the on what? Oh, on the fuel. Now the fuel pumps are on, and as you can see, the APU which we're going to start is its 
fuel from this tank right here, that line through that valve to that valve. But the APU also has its own fuel pump, so you don't have to turn the pumps on to start the APU. So let's start the APUs. Turn on the master switch, and you see the APU comes up on the ECAM. And let's hit start. And now we can watch the start over here on the ECAM page. And there it goes. The end is rotating. And it's getting a little warmer, but uh, in just a second, like now, the igniters will light the gas and it'll start up. And when the generator gets up here, it's starting to put out power, it'll say when now it's available. Let's go back down and look at the AC electrics. As you see, it's still showing external power. The electrical priorities in the airplane, even on the Airbus 320. Hey Nick, how you doing buddy? Nice to see you. How's that instrument training going? <laughs> yeah. Well, you'll be glad when that sucker's out of the way, won't you? That is a complicated rating to get. Especially these days with all this automation. When I went through Airbus school, I was an old guy, and it was really rough. The young guys had no problem with 130 different computers and direct law alternate law. <laughs> I'll tell you, I don't know. Although kind of stalling with the... Okay, so we're back here about the external power. So if we want to go to APU power on the generator I'm talking about, we need to go up and get rid of external power. Now watch on the screen there, it'll switch sides, and it's supposed to come back on. Huh. What happened? Guess I better turn my external power back on and troubleshoot this little hammer. Well, I thought I knew what I was doing. Let's get in here a little closer and see what we got. It says that the APU generator is available. So my understanding Oh yeah. I know all about touching down on 172 on the nose wheel first. That you get a really good ride when that happens. Always land on the main. Well, the thing you got to remember is if you touch down like that, and you'll know it right away. You got to get back up in the air if you're trying to land. If you got enough runway, you can uh, continue and try it. Okay, let's go back here and see what happened to my. Oh, so I see what happened. For some reason, I had my APU generator turned off. Therefore, when I now, if I get rid of external power, 
There it is. So that logic in the electrical system on Airbuses, if you've got external power plugged in, it's primary, even with the APU running. Shut the external off, and now you can use the APU generator. So while we're doing this, let's go over to the AV tab and go back to, we want to get rid of the chalk external power. And if we look outside, we're looking good. And we still have the Marshmore. <laughs> he does go away. But <laughs> Poor guy's been standing there with his arms up for two hours. Hey, did you have your instructor with you when this happened? It must, if you had your instructor with you, it must have been just bad enough that you'd get the crap scared out of you, but not bad enough that you would crash the plane. And that's the thing you're going to learn when you become a CFI is how far do you let a student go so that they get an example of what not to do, like touching down on the nose. You pull back on the yoke to prevent it. Very good. But you hit on the nose wheel first, right? And then she pulled back to make sure you didn't go any farther. <laughs> When I was in the training department on the CRJ at the airline, we had a lot of fun teaching the other instructors how to do their job. And of course we would do it in the simulator, but we did all kinds of terrible things to them for them to learn how to let the student go far enough that you don't wreck the airplane. I was out on the line one day and we were going into Washington, Dulles and a student was, FO was flying the CRJ and uh, he flared too high and I didn't do anything. And the airplane dropped from about 50 feet and then it hit and bounced up about 10 feet. <laughs> It scared the holy crap out of me, and I learned a big lesson that day. Anyway, as the people were getting off the airplane, there was a United uh, female flight officer in the back. <laughs> and I was standing at the door, you know, watching the people get off. And I go, hey, what was that like? And she said, ah, it felt like a normal landing to me. Now the really cool thing about the CRJ is it has trailing link gear. So what that means is is that the it's not a strut like on this Airbus we're looking at right here. It's not a strut that goes straight up. It's a trailing link. Ooh, night landings are even worse. Make sure you get that nose up. <laughs> anyway. So she said, oh, it's just like a normal landing, I thought. Okay, back inside. Now we have the... Let's see where I am. We have... We got all... We got rid of all that ground stuff. So let's go back to my little menu. Now, most of this stuff I've already done, so... But let's look at takeoff performance. Now this was interesting because the standard way that this comes up, supposedly you can request the ATIS, but I haven't been able to do that. I had to put in the wind temperature and altimeter. The runway is always dry, the anti-ice is off. You have to put in your takeoff weight. 
we're at the maximum weight, 337,000 pounds. This is a heavy, you have to say heavy with your call sign. I'll explain later about the flaps, they're kind of interesting. There's three settings. Flaps. The first number is the slats, and the second number is the flaps. So the settings are, of course, zero, zero, or 15, zero, or 15, 15, or 15, 20. Also, you can take off with the air conditioner on or off. Sometimes for performance, you need them off. And you can take off with toga power or flex. Now, this runway at this airport is short. And the only way I could get any speeds in was go full takeoff flaps, which is 1520. Air conditioners could stay on and need a toga takeoff. And uh, when I put that in, then it showed me my V speeds, the flaps, and the trim. And then you can send that to the FMS. way of getting your information. Well, let's look at the checklist here and see where we might cockpit prep and test complete. The fuel quantity, we're at 95,000 pounds. The takeoff data, let's make sure that's set. Let's go down to the FMS. Hey Nick, what do you think of this beluga? <laughs> this is really cool. So let's see if I have Oh I did I I populated that. So there's B1138, BR141, and B2, it says 100. That's because on this airplane, you have to set V2 in the flight control panel. So you have to set it right there. Also on this airplane is there's a card here with the numbers on it. So V2 is 147. Let's go up and set that. I'm glad I watched all the training films on this airplane. I would never have figured it out. <laughs> I'll show you something that's really interesting. So when you take off and you want to go toga, what you would normally do is you would push... Yeah. That DA-42 is weird looking too, and it? the tail's kind of skinny behind the fuselage. So normally on a takeoff where you're going to toga, you push a button on the side of the throttles and they go to toga. But that's a little bit hard to do in a flight sim with your yoke or your joystick. So what they did was, is that little screw right there, see how it turns into a finger? Anyway, that's what you press to do a toga push the throttles up. Let's see, the rest of this stuff is, we've got flaps 1520, the trim is one up. These are the flaps go up at 167, the slats at 205, 209, and it's clean at 240. Now let's look at the approach. See, here's another weird thing for the approach. It's got 2020 
or 3040. Remember I said down here there's a switch right here. If you flip that up, then you can do... see what it says. So 1520 or 3040. And if you forget to do that, you'll get a ground prox warning. Like I said, I'm really glad that I watched the... <laughs> we can put the MDA in here. Let's go look and see if we can uh, find that approach chart. We're going to shoot the R Navrunwick 26 in the Goose Bay. <laughs> I love it. And the V LBP MDA is 353. So we can put it in. And there it is. One thing that the guy was uh, explaining was is the FMS in this airplane has some minuscule amount of memory. I mean, it's like in kilobytes, not megabytes, not gigabytes, kilobytes. And one reason the, they uh, made it flash when you input stuff is because it kind of shows you that what it does so the acceleration altitude is a thousand feet let's go back to our flight plan okay again this nice takeoff card is here our max takeoff weight unfortunately this is showing in kilograms so 153 kilograms. No flex. CG's 18.9. Trim is one up. Acceleration altitude is 1,045. That's because the field elevation is 1,000. And then there's a landing card in here. I guess you can't really. Uh, see it right here. Okay, let's go back. When you're lost, go back to the check. So there's takeoff path. So, hit once, field elevation for the landing. Great. Hey, instrument pilot, where is that? That's down to 353. Okay. What this is showing is... Right here is where he set the... That might have been 150. That's the pressurization. Oh. Slip your mouse here, you can see the path movement. Landing elevation is for the pressurization. Remember, uh, oops, that. Pilot view. Have tab. Takeoff data, elevation, altimeter, 1022. Let me set that. Now I can set any of these, so and they'll all set. Well, this is something I don't understand. If you set 1022, let's try it. Zero two 
too, and that's 260 feet, but that's not right, and I'm not sure why, because the field elevation here is 40 feet, so I'm not sure why it's not showing the right, uh, right amount. Well, let's go back. Breaking action, normal and on, anti-skid, I'm sorry, anti-skid, windows and doors, both closed, beacon on, parking brake is required. So let's look at the brake anti-skid. So it's right there. There's a switch right there. Brake anti-skid is normal, and we've already selected auto brakes in the max for takeoff. Beacon. The beacon I had already turned on. Let's see if we see it. Not sure where. Oh, there it is. Oh, my lights are on, but. Oh, the beacon's on. That's good. Have a tab. Parking brake. It is on. Now we're ready to start. Let's go and look at the start seat. Now, the one thing I haven't watched is what the standard operating procedure for the airplane is. So, I'm just kind of winging that with my experience. So, to start the engine, you need a couple things. You need the AP1, which it is. Go back 
to start, we're going to use A. We are going to select start on. And then we're going to go down to the center. So again, analog and digital. In the Airbus 320, all of this is on the screen. But here you've got the bleeds, vibration, fuel flow. Now what caused it to do that? Anybody know the answer? It's because the number two generator came on. It causes the electrical to fluctuate. So now you basically got two, four, six. There's a fuel flow and the number two engine is starting. Let's start the number one.
car for takeoff, and this is 30, 40 for landing.
whatever was wrong because takeoff is okay. So anti-ice hand signals. Here, Nick, can you hear me? So we're ready to text.
said my first take off was no good. Great. Let's see what happens on this one. Doesn't look like anybody's watching me, so we're okay. Need to take the brake off.
Mr. Hampy. <laughs> it doesn't take too much to make you happy. Let's go outside and look around while we're here. Got that cool bottom. There's the top of the tail. Right wing with the front, backwards, with the forward, right engine, turning, left engine. Then we look at the ailerons are up. I just love it. And we can go standard. Normally you'd 
gonna be an in room. Still at 250 knots, and we're climbing about 1400 feet a minute. We're out of 21 nine. but you'd be climbing like 100 feet a minute. Cut this into segments. So. All I gotta do is figure out how to save my position so I can resume on Wednesday. And we'll go over and land. And then we'll do a flight over to Kansas City. Fuel flows are 11.15. Cockpit temperature. 25, so let's see that's 50 and 30 to 80. Yeah, it's nice and warm in here. Cabin altitude's up to 2470, even though we're at 25,000. Normal PSI is about 8.6 up at the The fuel flows 4.46 pounds per hour times a thousand. Not sure what these say. Oh, kilograms. Uh. <laughs> no, we don't like kilograms. Let's see our PSI. Say what that is here now. The soil temperature. Soil quantity PSI. Twenty-five seven. Still climbing. 
climbing over a thousand feet a minute, not bad. cargo do it. I'm still sitting there. Flight level 270 for flight level 280. Not bad. Still climbing about 800 feet a minute. So this airplane does not go very fast. It does not climb very high. It only cruises at about 0.68 knots. Six one mark. Not bad. Comes our flight level two eight zero down. No, oh, it's showing it down here too. Now we're at green dot. That's the slowest speed you can climb green. So doing a good job. Level off at 280. And there's all green and mock. And we want 68. So let's set that. Okay, let's see if it'll accelerate the 68 mock. We got a message. I'm not sure where we got the message, but we'll look at it. No displayed nav aid, okay. Okay, so we're on M146 going to Lusson. No, we just passed it. And the flight plan says 7-7, seven, seven, but we're only going at 6-8. Um,
time. about two hours of extra fuel. Fuel prediction page. could go up to flight level 296. I think one of those oceanic routes is the minimum altitude is flight level 290. Oh cool. We have 1937 miles to destination. And we're auto-tuned to IOM.
took a trip to Ireland. We spent uh, about a week in the southern part, and then after I saw that, I found out that I was really from Northern Ireland, where my ancestors came from. So I guess someday I'll have to go back and take a look. We're speed at uh, 401 knots, and our ETA is still 1941. <laughs> Pretty amazing. Test one, two. There I am. Andrew. That's Ireland.
just playing with my settings. I'm doing replay mode and it's not responding, so we'll have to wait and see. It may crash. Nope, it didn't. Very good. Oh, there it goes. Wow, the frame rate's up to 42. Uh-oh. There it went. Let's see what happens. Well, I hope you enjoyed this first part of this flight from... Wales to the to Canada. Hmm. Me sitting back on the ground. Oh, we can go watch a takeoff again. Let's try that. that poor guy. Sounds like it's running. Shadow is changing shape. <laughs> Getting longer and longer and longer. Uh oh, we're on the runway. take off from up here. Here we go. Here we come. Nice job.
Now that's a great shot right there. Looks like it's got an awful little wing for such a huge airplane. <laughs> Let's go back. Oh, there's pulling out on the runway. Oh, we can watch this take off from closer up. If you follow that line, right in here you need to turn and get on the center line. kind of fun to do, uh, who cares about that in root part? Let's see how long it was before I started to take off. A lot of times it doesn't like going fast.
Oh, here we go. I guess the doors will catch up in a little bit. There they go. Okay, well that was a fun uh, step in. Only 57 minutes, huh? Okay, well, I think that was very successful. So, on Wednesday, we'll start at uh, one of the fixes closer to uh, Goose Bay, and we'll go in and land. Again, thanks for Lori4444 for following, and Prince Huffington Fino for his $2. <laughs> that was my very first and only donation so far. <laughs> Okay, well, as always, fly safely and uh, good night.